Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Kowalski. I work in the Educational Program Department at, at NORD, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's webinar, The FDA's Role in Gene Therapy. We're pleased to feature two key staff from the FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research today to familiarize you with the FDA's role in the development and approval of safe and effective gene therapies. Today's event is part of our cost-free series of educational webinars for patients and caregivers. This is the third webinar in a five-part series on gene therapy. NORD is collaborating with the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy to provide this series. ASGCT is a reputable authority on gene therapy with a mission to advance knowledge and awareness about gene therapy. We're pleased to work together to bring you accurate and accessible education. NORD is an independent organization dedicated to improving the lives of people with rare diseases. We do this through education, research, advocacy, and patient services. You can learn more about NORD's programs, services, and resources on our website at rarediseases.org. And you can also follow NORD on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Peter Marks is the director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration. The center is responsible for assuring the safety and effectiveness of biological products, including vaccines, blood and blood products, and cellular tissue and gene therapies. Dr. Marks joined the FDA in 2012 as the deputy center, center director for CBER and became center director in 2016. Dr. Marks is a board certified uh, internal medicine physician um, and also a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Julie Tierney advises the CBER Center director and senior staff on an array of issues, including regulatory policy, statutory mandates, and legislative strategy. She joined the FDA in 2008 as an Associate Chief Counsel for Drugs, then later served as the FDA's detailee to the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Prior to working at FDA, Ms. Tierney practiced food and drug law at private law firms. She received her JD from Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, and with that, I will turn uh, this over to our first speaker, Dr. Peter Marks. So thank you very much. So I'll try to take you through a bit of what FDA's role is in gene therapy and also give you a little bit of a background about uh, gene therapy. And then Julie Tierney will take you through some of the pathways, uh, programs that FDA uh, uses to help facilitate uh, novel product development of things like gene therapy. So I'll start by giving you an overview of drug development talk about the stages of clinical trials, also focusing on how there are differences between clinical trials uh, performed for large indications and small uh, orphan indications, uh, and uh, then talk a little bit about gene therapy. And then Julie, as I, as I mentioned, will uh, talk about orphan product development, uh, priority review vouchers, and expediting product development. So FDA does its work um, in what I would best describe as a product development ecosystem, which um, it's got a lot of moving parts. Um, and ultimately, our piece in that ecosystem is to make sure that medical products are safe and that they meet a legal standard for efficacy. Um, and that means that today we're involved in the process of product development uh, from when they're conceived uh, very early on uh, all the way up through post-market surveillance to make sure they remain safe while they are on the market. Other parts of that uh, product development ecosystem include a variety of stakeholders, including patients and their families, uh, advocacy organizations, researchers and physicians, uh, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies, and trade organizations. And each of these has an important role to play. And increasingly over the past years, we've uh, we've basically embraced the fact that patients and families 
have a very important voice in how drugs are developed, and now we have things like patient-focused drug development meetings. Uh, so that's uh, increasingly uh, acknowledged the role of all of the different stakeholders, uh, but importantly, patients and families um, in how products are developed. So I'm now going to go through kind of the milestones about how drugs are developed. And there are essentially five key pieces that I'll go through, and I'm going to amplify on each of these as I go through subsequent slides. So drug development proceeds through discovery, which is the initial finding of the product, through to preclinical research, understanding initial concepts about it, then through clinical research, investigating how it uh, behaves when it is given to people. And then there's a process which includes the regulatory review to assess how the data uh, support um, uh, what might be an approval. Uh, and then, obviously, once the drug is marketed, if it makes it to market, we then want to make sure that it remains safe uh, while it's on the market. Now, I should just say before going to the next slide that there is some overlap here um, in that um, it's not uncommon to have preclinical research continue while clinical research is ongoing. And in many cases, uh, there's clinical research ongoing when regulatory review happens. But um, this is basically the, the general order of how things proceed. So discovery uh, is a little bit different depending on the type of uh, therapeutic agent that is being uh, looked at. For small molecule drugs, uh, things that end up becoming pills, uh, uh, there's a screening of compounds uh, to find beneficial effects on a disease or condition is one way that these are identified. Um, sometimes uh, those same types of molecules are looked at um, by just repurposing existing products to treat a new disease entity, um, things, drugs that may work in one condition sometimes have been shown to work in a very different condition. Another way that discovery goes forward is by having new insights from research into a disease process, which allows rational product design. And that actually is probably the category that is most applicable um, to what happens for gene therapies and uh, uh, other targeted therapies. So when one actually understands the mechanism that causes disease, in other words, there is a defect in a specific gene uh, or an abnormality in a protein, one can go ahead and then rationally target uh, that condition either by uh, giving a medicine that changes the activity of the protein or replaces it um, or uh, by uh, replacing the gene itself. And uh, there are actually also now newer technologies that allow drug delivery um, uh, or manipulation of genetic material, and that's yet another uh, uh, technology that has uh, allowed us to uh, manipulate uh, genes to be able to uh, create products that might uh, benefit people. The preclinical research phase of product development occurs after somebody has identified something that's usually called a lead compound um, that uh, wants to then take that product into clinical trials eventually in humans. And there's a phase in which the product is tested um, usually in animals or um, in the Petri dish uh, to uh, see uh, whether it has toxic effects. Um, and whether or not it has uh, the potential to have uh, the beneficial effects that are expected on the condition being studied. Um, the, as I've already alluded to, there are two major types of preclinical research. Uh, there's in vitro experiments, which are performed in cell or tissue culture, and then in vivo experiments, which are animal experiments. And today, computer modeling can also contribute to this. It, it, it's a, a, just a simple fact that we still need animal experiments in many cases in medicine to be able to show us whether something is going to be safe to be able to put into uh, people. 
we do ex animal experiments and drug development uh, trying to minimize the use of number of animals necessary, um, but uh, they still provide very, very valuable information um, in, in the drug development process. Increasingly, we're seeing ways that might help replace animal studies by the use of uh, things like slabs of tissue that can be placed on a uh, chip, and so it more resembles an in vitro type of approach. Uh, but um, both in vitro and in vivo experiments are used in the preclinical research uh, that's done to support uh, whether a product can be put into humans, both to make sure that it's safe and that it has some uh, evidence that it might be effective uh, before it's studied in humans. Now, the, this slide shows a variety of other studies that, go, that happen as drug development proceeds further. And some of it, uh, of this work might be started while a product is still uh, in the preclinical phase, but some of this continues all throughout the drug development life cycle. And those includes, include trying to understand how the body takes up the, the drug, how it uh, metabolizes it, and how it excretes it. So that's absorption, distribution, excretion, and metabolism. Um, we try to understand uh, the mechanism of action and how the potential benefits of that drug are provided. One wants to understand the best dosage and the best way to give the drug or the route of administration that it's going to be given by. And then obviously one wants to understand side effects or other adverse events that might occur with it. And there are some specific things that we also like to try to understand uh, as the drug development process proceeds, such as how it affects different groups of people, such as people of different genders, race, or ethnicity, and how it interacts with other drugs and treatments because Many people don't take just one medication. They take more than one medication. One needs to understand that. And ultimately, uh, one like, would like to understand the effectiveness of a given drug as compared with similar drugs, although that usually comes late in the process after a product has already been in clinical trials for some time. As we go about the drug development process, um, we use certain drug development tools and uh, sometimes you'll hear about biomarkers. Biomarkers are usually uh, best described as tests that can be done, laboratory tests that can be done to help indicate whether a drug is having its intended effect uh, or whether there are potentially safety concerns that might be occurring from that drug. Um, we talk about trial specific biomarkers because sometimes there are uh, biomarkers that can be followed that are very specific for a particular drug. And other times, uh, there may be not specific for a drug, in which case uh, biomarkers can be uh, more generalized and they can be part of a formal qualification program, uh, which is uh, conducted here at FDA. We also use uh, complex innovative trial designs when appropriate. And the reason why I mention these is because for small populations of patients, uh, these can be very helpful. Um, uh, Bayesian, designs, uh, Bayesian designs basically look to use all the potential statistical information that one can get um, by looking at uh, the chance uh, that a product is going to be uh, effective that you know before you study it and look at how the, the trial that you do changes that um, moving forward, that's a, kind of an oversimplification, but it's uh, an example of that. And adaptive clinical trial designs allows one to modify uh, the conduct of the study as it progresses based on some predefined uh, parameters. And that can be very helpful as well because it can facilitate trials moving through development more quickly. As I've already mentioned, we try to do patient-focused drug development, which means that we try to understand what patients want from a therapy uh, before we move forward. And we use real-world evidence, particularly in the post-market setting today, um, when we can to streamline development. Um, and so these are a variety of tools that are used, and they can, they're, they're generally used as clinical, the clinical trial process 
uh, moves along. Now, as the different phases of clinical research, we often will hear of phase one, two, three, four trials, and I just want to explain uh, what these uh, generally mean. And it's important to understand that, um, th that these are rough definitions and not hard and fast definitions. So phase one clinical trials um, are generally the initial safety and dose finding trials that involve about 100, uh, somewhere on the order of 10 to 100 people. Um, uh, and they are what is done to make sure that uh, there's not something uh, that would preclude that drug from being studied further. Uh, in other words, some adverse safety event. Phase two clinical trials are conducted once one feels comfortable that the drug can be given to a larger group of people, and they usually look to demonstrate initial evidence of efficacy and look for uh, side effects of the drug in a larger group of people, generally ranging from 50 to 500. Phase three studies are the definitive uh, efficacy and side effects studies, often called pivotal studies, and for certain indications, they can range from including 100 to even 10,000 or more patients. And phase four studies are generally done after a product is approved to get additional efficacy or safety information. Now, obviously, these sizes are very large compared to uh, most of the rare diseases that are around. And so, obviously, we can't expect trials of these kinds of sizes uh, for rare diseases. And so when we're looking at rare diseases, the clinical trial programs are developed to be fit for purpose and depend on several factors, which include the strength of the effect that we see or expect to see and the ability to measure outcomes. And so sometimes clinical development programs can involve a very small number of patients, particularly when one understands the mechanism of action of the drug and when, when one has a good understanding of the disease. Uh, and so in this type of setting, a phase one, two study, uh, which would be the initial safety and dose finding trial, uh, might also look for initial efficacy, and that could be in five to 20 individuals. And phase two, which in this case might be the pivotal trial, the one that could lead to submission of an application to FDA for uh, approval could simply further look at efficacy and side effects, and that might involve from 20 to 100 patients. And if you look at some of our recent approvals uh, in the gene therapy space, um, that is, uh, that's reflected there. As we uh, go ahead and develop drugs, um, it's not just the clinical piece that's important, it's also the manufacturing. And particularly as we talk about gene therapies, uh, manufacturing turns out to be one of the most important aspects uh, of developing these products. That's particularly true because oftentimes their effect in clinical development is very clear, but making sure that they're well made uh, and made consistently can be more challenging. This slide shows a graph which shows how FDA thinks about manufacturing as products are developed, which is that when products first enter clinical development, we have a relatively lower stringency for the manufacturing standards than as they advance through. As the products advance through to approval, there is an increased stringency on the manufacturing standards. Um, and that, that basically reflects the fact that um, once one gets to a final product, one really needs to have a very consistent process um, that people can rely upon. When we think about gene therapies, at FDA we're increasingly uh, encouraging people to get to a, uh, a very standardized manufacturing process as early as possible because sometimes products as as you have already mentioned, can be approved in phase two. So getting to a standardized manufacturing process early on can be very important. Once the product is, uh, is been studied, 
uh, and a sponsor puts together uh, an application to FDA for approval, and that contains information on product composition, manufacturers, the non-clinical studies, those are the preclinical studies that have been conducted, as well as the clinical trials. And then FDA reviews that product application uh, and inspects facilities uh, where the product is being made. They may inspect facilities where uh, the clinical trials have been conducted. And we also may consult outside experts prior to approving the product. Sometimes we may even place uh, conditions on the approval in order to make sure uh, that the product can be used safely. Um, and this is kind of the net result of uh, our process of getting things uh, to market. Once they're on the market, um, our responsibility doesn't end there. We continue to monitor safety through passive surveillance, and that's when patients or providers tell us that there has been an adverse effect uh, through MedWatch forms that are submitted to the agency or through other methods. We also conduct active surveillance, and that is we will actually use large databases to see if there are any adverse effects. And the FDA has a large system called the Sentinel system, which is a claims-based database, which allows us to uh, look for adverse events. And we use other systems as well. And we also review phase four studies that are conducted by companies. So to finish up, I'm just going to say a few words about uh, gene therapy and, and the excitement in this area. Clearly, this is an incredibly uh, exciting field right now with many, many uh, applications uh, in development, uh, many of which are in development for rare diseases. We currently have over 800 active gene therapy investigational new drug applications. Um, and the rate at which we're receiving investigational new drug applications is increasing quite noticeably. In calendar year 2017, we had received 106 uh, investigation new drug applications, and that nearly doubled uh, in 2018. The advances in gene therapy have largely been made possible by the fact that the field has basically settled on two major vector systems for use in gene therapy. By all means, these are not the only ones, and in some cases, there are non-viral ways of delivering gene therapy. But the two major ways that these are being delivered today are through lentiviral vectors, and that's being used for cell-based gene therapies generally, and adeno-associated viral gene therapies, which are being used uh, for directly administered uh, gene therapies, such as the recent gene therapy that was approved for spinal muscular atrophy. There are some challenges in this area. Um, and uh, many of them relate to manufacturing issues, um, uh, and uh, some of them relate to the fact that because when one uses a virus, uh, one has to deal with the fact that there can be pre-existing immunity that prevents one from being able to use that viral uh, vector to uh, deliver a gene therapy, but people are working to get over uh, those humps by making new vectors that don't uh, have, uh, to which people do not have pre-existing immunity. We still have to make sure that these things are safe over the long term uh, uh, and that they remain efficacious. Uh, we have to make sure that our clinical development can proceed effectively in these uh, areas with very small populations, and that's something we're working on. And as I've already mentioned, uh, we're working to help uh, improve manufacturing of these products with the idea being that if the manufacturing could be improved and streamlined, uh, first of all, they would be more available, and second of all, hopefully their costs would come down. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over uh, to uh, Julie Tierney, who will take us through promoting product development. Hi there. Thank you, Peter. Um, this is Julie Tierney from the Center for Biologics. Um, so, Today I'm going to use, uh, talk about some of the tools that are in FDA's regulatory toolbox that we use to help promote product development, particularly in the area of gene therapy and, and rare disease development. Um, I think that as part of FDA's mission is to promote the public health, and, and we've recognized that a very important part of that is to help facilitate the development and approval of innovative products that 
um, address unmet medical needs and to help uh, sponsors and researchers do that in an as efficient manner as possible. Um, Congress has certainly recognized that as well and put in place a number of different incentive programs for companies in the rare disease space. Um, and then a number of programs that, that FDA uses to give attention to these products as well. First, I'm going to talk about um, FDA's User Fee Act, which some folks may have heard about, um, the Orphan Drug Act, uh, priority review vouchers, and expedited development programs. Uh, first, I'll focus on our user fee programs, um, and those started in 1992 with the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, or PDUFA. Um, we're now in PDUFA 6, going into PDUFA 7 in a few years. Those are reauthorized every, every five years, and basically Congress has put in place a program um, where companies pay fees that help staff the agency, so they're not paying fees directly for the staff that look at their applications, but for general staff at the agency in return for FDA meeting certain goals um, that are timeframes for, for meeting with industry and reviewing their applications. So it's not a guarantee of approval, but it gives FDA the resources to um, review product applications and provide advice to sponsors in a timely manner. Um, we have them for all of our various user fee, uh, various medical products, but the most relevant to gene therapies is PDUSA. Um, the Orphan Drug Act, which was passed in the um, early 1980s, has been uh, incredibly effective at incentivizing the development of drugs and biologics um, for rare diseases, which is defined in the Act as, as less than 200,000 people in the U.S. And when I say it's been tremendously effective, I think, you know, I want to highlight we've moved from having only a few approved products for, for patients with rare diseases to the majority of FDA's drug and biologics approval being for patients with rare diseases. Um, on the other hand, we recognize there is still tremendous unmet need for so many rare diseases. Um, some of the features of orphan, uh, orphan exclusivity, designation and exclusivity, are tax credits, an exemption from those user fees that I just talked about, and if approved, uh, seven years of exclusivity, which would block competitors from coming to market. So it can be a very valuable incentive to, um, to companies. Um, another incentive program that, that Congress has put in place uh, is the Priority Review Voucher Program, and there's several of them, and I think the most relevant to folks that are interested in rare diseases and in gene therapies is the Rare Pediatric Disease Program, that Priority Review Voucher Program. Uh, basically, a sponsor who receives approval for a drug or a biologic for um, a rare pediatric disease will qualify for a, a voucher, and then that can be either used by that company or sold to another company who can redeem it in order to get priority review for a subsequent application. So um, all of our gene therapies that have pediatric indications have received this. Uh, the way it would work, I guess, in practice, an example would be good. In 2014, the first rare pediatric disease priority review voucher was received by Biomarin uh, for their product. They then sold, uh, sold the voucher to another company, Regeneron, for about $65 million. Regeneron redeemed that for their product, which would not have qualified for priority review, and because of it, their review was shortened from 10 months to 6 months, and they were able to get on the market uh, sooner than a competitor. So in this way, the, sort of the private market can help, um, help incentivize uh, the development for these certain groups of products, including those for rare pediatric diseases. And far and away, the rare pediatric disease PRV program has been the most popular with sponsors, and we've given out the most priority review vouchers in that space. And so those are the incentives that, that Congress has put in place, but there's a number of programs that FDA has developed over the years that have um, then been codified in statute that, um, that FDA uses to help uh, expedite the development and review of products uh, that show uh, the potential to address unmet needs and serious and life-threatening illnesses. Now, because there's such tremendous unmet, unmet need in rare diseases, we see sponsors of products for rare diseases heavily utilizing these programs and all of the benefits that go with them in terms of increased attention from the agency. Um, all of them have specific criteria, which I'll talk a little bit about, but they all go back to the idea of when you have a product that is um, intended to address an unmet need in a serious or life-threatening disease or condition, you know, these are the products that FDA needs to, 
draw attention at and really work to try to help the sponsors get them on the market as soon as they can show that they're safe and effective. All of the gene therapies that CBER has approved over the past few years have heavily utilized these expedited development programs. All of them have been breakthrough designated. Some have gotten um, orphan exclusivity. Some have gotten the priority review voucher programs. All of them have gotten priority review or fast track. The fast track is the first one, and I think that these are kind of chronological in order. The fast track is something that a sponsor can come in and get very early on. It can be based on in vitro data. Um, or, or early clinical data kind of demonstrating the potential to address an unmet need. So it's really just a proof of concept. And with that, they get some additional meetings from FDA um, and the ability to do a roll-in review, which means they can um, file pieces of their marketing application as they become uh, ready, rather than waiting for all of it to be ready. Priority review comes, though, once um, once a app marketing application is filed with the agency. Um, and this goes back to the idea of these user fees that help staff the agency appropriately so that we can uh, efficiently review things. So when an application comes in for a product that, based on what we see there, could represent a significant improvement in safety and effectiveness over, um, over available therapy, at that point FDA will make the determination that we will give it a six-month review rather than a 10-month standard review, and, and for some products where there's particularly compelling data or um, um, already, we may try to shorten that even more. Um, if there are no options for a particular therapy, then that's almost certainly going to represent a significant improvement in safety and effectiveness. But we also look at whether something's a first in class or might show improvement over available therapies for patients. Um, and what this means is just that we're going to put more resources and try to get the review done more quickly. Again, it's no guarantee that a product will be approved unless it meets the approval standards, but it means that a product could come to, to market months sooner than it would if it got a standard review, and that's particularly important when you've got such unmet needs. Accelerated approval um, is a type of approval pathway, and I, I think that there often people get a little bit confused because of its title because it sounds like it would be great, that it must be the quickest way to get approval. Um, but it does have certain criteria that, that come along with it that actually um, only work in certain situations and may not be any quicker than traditional approval. Um, so Dr. Marks talked a little bit about biomarkers and how you know, they might measure you know, be a blood test or something that, that sort of can be measured clinically. Um, that's not how a patient feels, function, or survives, and it kind of can stand in instead of the actual clinical benefit of the product. So a, a classic example will be measuring the viral load in a patient's blood um, instead of looking at whether they're uh, cured from HIV. So you're kind of doing a lab measurement instead of waiting to see how a disease develops in a, in a patient. Um, for that, if, there's, um, if we think that that marker is, well, is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit, FDA can grant accelerated approval if the sponsor applies for it. And then in the post-market, the sponsor would have to show that that, um, that that marker actually does, is actually linked to clinical benefit and has the effect that we expect it to. It has to meet the same approval standard. It's just that we're using a different endpoint in these cases. And sometimes it can be faster because if you're not waiting to see a longer-term clinical effect, um, you know you might be able to get your clinical trials done more quickly. But you know if you don't have biomarkers or you don't have a good understanding of the natural history of the disease, which is often often the case in, in rare diseases, um, it may not be an option. Or accelerated approval may not be faster than doing a traditional approval with a traditional clinical uh, traditional clinical endpoint. So. I think that people often get excited about accelerated approval, and it certainly is one of the programs that we do use, but it's not necessary in order to have uh, your product moving along quickly and to have FDA attention on it. And again, all of these, all of these programs are available for products that have a potential to address an unmet need and where there's a serious or life-threatening infection or a disease or condition. We don't want to be... Um, you know, putting all of these resources into products that aren't going to be really helping patients that don't have options or where it's a, you know, a, a non-serious disease. Those do, of course, come through FDA, but 
when we, when we talk about these programs and the amount of attention and resources they, they use, we want to be looking at, at things that are really uh, seriously affecting patients. So two of our newest programs, two of our new expedited programs, I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, breakthrough therapy designation. It's a designation program that sponsors can get when they start their clinical trials, um, or if they have some um, preliminary clinical evidence of the benefit of their of their drug or biologic, they can come in and get this designation. Uh, the benefits of it are that they get earlier and more frequent interactions with the review divisions, they get commitment from senior leaders in the organization, and some other benefits to help continue to move move it move the program forward to make sure that it's as efficient as possible. Sort of an all hands on deck approach. Um, all of our gene therapies have, have received this designation and the um, benefits that accrue from it. And really, the, these interactions can help make development more efficient. Um, our newest expedited program, which was part of the 21st Century Cures Act in 2016, is the Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy Designation Program, or RMAT. And that was intended, uh, that was it enacted by Congress to address some groups of biological products that they weren't sure were getting the benefits of all of the expedited programs and to make very clear that they were available for them. So um, it applies to certain cell and gene therapies, tissue engineering products, um, human cell and tissue products, combination products. And basically it, um, again, has a designation based on early clinical data and gives uh, early and frequent interactions with the agency, other benefits of, of breakthrough designation. There's also some flexibility about the post-approval requirements if the product's approved under accelerated approval. This has been very popular, particularly in CBER among our cellular product sponsors. Um, most of the, the um, vector-based gene therapies that are directly administered have gotten breakthrough. Um, you know, we see a mix and match, but that's definitely one that's been very popular among our sponsors. And this is just some highlights of the statistics of RMAT. Um, you know, we received our first designation request the day after the law was enacted. Um, we've gotten 115 requests then over about the past three years, um, granted about 44 of them, which is around the same rate uh, that breakthrough designations have been granted. Um, like other programs like Breakthrough and the other expedited programs, we see these um, being very popular among sponsors of products for rare diseases because you know, we are looking at such innovative technologies for patients that have um, very little therapeutic options. So, so in closing, um, I'll let Dr. Mark do, do the main closing, but I did just want to stress that all of these different programs and tools that FDA has, we're using these to give extra, extra attention to products that show promise for patients with uh, unmet needs and in serious diseases, and of course that means a lot of rare disease patients, and, and these programs are heavily used by those sponsors. Um, you know, we have the same approval standard, um, and, and they make our sponsors meet those, but these are tools that we can use to help make um, programs more efficient and to get products to market sooner once they're shown to be safe and effective. Thanks, Julie. No, that was a great overview. Um, really, I just want to conclude by taking a moment to say that really this is I, I hope we've been able to convey some of the uh, enthusiasm uh, in the in the area of development uh, of gene therapy and other products. Uh, and I think the next decades we'll see the development of numerous gene therapy products as well as other novel products that will really transform people's lives. We fully recognize that we're going to have to have approaches that are flexible and that will need to either be uh, developed or adapted to accommodate the novel nature of some of the uh, products that are going to be developed, as well as how we're going to have to study some of these in people um, who have uh, diseases where the natural history, the natural history may not be clear um, or may be in the process of being clarified as we're studying them. So there are some challenges that we understand we'll have to overcome. Uh, as we go through this, though, um, we will continue to take uh, a scientific pr approach to how we regulate um, based on the evidence that's presented to us um, with the knowledge that if we do so and if we follow the science closely, um, we can evaluate innovative technologies, we can evaluate benefit against risk, taking into account the uncertainties that exist to come up with a, 
an assessment about whether products um, will be safe and effective for people. Because our ultimate goal here, uh, which sometimes gets lost in all of the other things we say, um, is that we want to see important products that will help people's lives make it to them. Uh, so the goal at the end of the day is to make sure products that help people feel, function, or survive better get there as fast as they can. Uh, and uh, obviously our goal is to make sure that they get there um, being both safe as well as effective. So with that, I think we'll have some time for questions, but I'll turn it over to our moderator. Yeah, no, thank you, um, Dr. Marks and Ms. Tierney, for your informative and also very thoughtful presentations. Uh, you shared a lot of uh, important information that is very relevant for this audience. So we've um, collected questions from participants during the webinar, and yes, we'll move to a Q&A session. Um, the team is going to try to answer as many of your questions as possible, but we may not get to all of them. I see that we have a very active audience. Um, so if we don't get to your question, um, please feel free to email it to education at rarediseases.org, and someone on the team will follow up with you. So um, first question, many of these gene therapies have been referred to as cures. Can you speak to whether um, this is the correct way for patients to think of them, and are they really cures? So I guess I'll take that question. We've, we've lapsed into calling them cures. I think probably the, the best way to speak about some of them are potential cures. I think we don't know until we have many years of data that they are cures for sure. Um, and because some of these are uh, being administered with vectors that, that could potentially uh, change their efficacy over time, I think the best way to say it is that these are, um, they're certainly transformative treatments and potentially cures in many cases. Um, uh, and, and that's just the scientist in us that comes out uh, that doesn't want to overpromise what they might be. I think as we gain more experience with these products, we'll be able to talk about cures uh, more uh, confidently, but right now I think we'd call them, in many cases, transformative treatments and potential cures. Yeah, thank you. No, that's very helpful and I think also a, a prudent approach. Um, so next question is about expediting the approval of these products. Um, does um, the accelerated pathway and expedited approval make the products more risky and less safe than products that have uh, more traditional and longer approval timelines? Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I think with these expedited programs, it's very important to remember that they're held to the same uh, statutory standard for approval of safety and effectiveness as other products. Um, what they do mean is that we are providing more resources towards more efficient development programs, perhaps, helping sponsors think about different ways to get there. But um, sponsors have to demonstrate that these products are safe and effective um, in order to get approval. And even um, accelerated approval, that is a full approval. Um, there are post-marketing requirements that come after that to, to confirm that there is the connection between that surrogate endpoint um, and the clinical benefit, and sometimes that, that isn't demonstrated. There's some uncertainty there, that's true. Um, but they do have to show that it's safe and effective and that there's substantial evidence uh, there and that the benefits exceed the risk. Yeah, thank you, Julie. And, you know, I heard this question come up a number of times at recent NORD events, so I think that's a really um, important point to, to make clear to, to, to the general public. Um, Next question, and I know Dr. Marks had a, a, a slide on this, but um, it says, could you give us a better sense of how many gene and cell therapies we can expect to see in the coming years? And then second part of the question, are there certain disease states that are more of a focus than others? So again, excellent question. I, I, we, we generally try not to say uh, ourselves because we have insider knowledge about what might be approved, but I'll quote somebody else, which is the, 
uh, the MIT New Digs group, which is a, they're a, kind of a group that's pretty understanding of the gene therapy technologies, they predicted that by the year 2030, there might be 40 to 60 marketed gene therapy products in the United States. And I, I don't think they're, they're, they're probably not that far off. Um, could it be less, a little bit less than that? Could it be a little more? Sure. But I think, um, I think what we're, we will see is the growth in this area such that um, we'll see a number of approvals each year in the coming years, and that will probably increase with time. As far as what diseases are being uh, are most amenable right now, really the, the the diseases that have tended to be the first up for gene therapies to date have been ones where you can locally administer the therapy, such as the gene therapy administered into the eye, or where um, one has a very defined endpoint and a very defined natural history that makes it easy to think about um, what you'll be looking at in terms of an effect. The gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy, the severe form, was an example of understanding the severe effect that one might be looking uh, to alleviate. Uh, another example that's not yet an approved product, but where there's a lot of interest, is in the area of hemophilia, because there the endpoints are relatively clear. Um, I think. To summarize, I think right now the work has really focused on uh, the most on, on diseases where there's a single gene disorder that one can address um, uh, and, uh, and uh, where the endpoints are pretty clear. I should say the, the, the caveat to that is that for, um, for relatively uncommon cancers that are being addressed by cell-based gene therapies, that's a little bit different, but um, uh, in general, again, for, for genetic diseases, um, the focus has been on relatively well-defined ones where um, the populations aren't too, too big, um, where we can make enough of these products and where one can understand the outcomes. Great. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and then I'll segue to another question, which is asking about uh, our gene therapy dispense through regular channels, such as um, pharmacies and hospital pharmacies? So gene therapies are going to have to be administered generally <laughs> through uh, expert centers. Um, and so that although they may pass through, uh, a, uh, they may be received in a hospital pharmacy, they're going to be administered um, in, by a, a, a specialty uh, provider in general. Um, at least at this point in time. I think do-it-yourself kits are a ways away off in the future. Um, I'm just joking about that. Um, uh, these are not going to be, these are going to be things that are going to have to be carefully uh, given, in part because um, for some of these, one has to be careful that there aren't adverse effects that are triggered by the way they're administered or the way they become effective. So uh, this, these are going to be products that are going to be given by generally by specialty providers who are familiar uh, with giving gene therapies. Great. And, and actually, we have a couple physicians coming on our next webinar who administer gene therapies. And I um, can't 100% promise, but one thing they were talking about was um, showing a video of a, of a gene therapy administration, and they definitely will be talking about um, the follow-ups and how the process works in their centers. Um, so next question, could you provide an estimate of the number of agents that have been approved um, under accelerated approval and how many of those subsequently failed uh, confirmatory clinical follow-up studies and thus uh, had their approval revoked? Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure that I have the statistics uh, easily on hand. Um, it, it is a good number of, of products. That, that program's been around for um, about 25 years. Um, there are some that have uh, failed to confirm clinical benefit. Um, after approval, and those have either been withdrawn um, or that indication withdrawn, um, or uh, FDA has worked with the sponsor, and actually the sponsor has voluntarily withdrawn it. Usually we do not need to um, go through a hearing. Um, that is 
that is an area that we continue to work on, though. Right. I mean, by, by and large, though, in order to take something, it, there, it, we, we generally try to give products the benefit of the doubt. Um, that said, there have been a few occasions when things have come off the market. In some cases, they've come off the market only to be studied more thoroughly and then go back on the market. And I can think of a drug for in the oncology space where uh, that was very clearly the, the, the case. And uh, I, I probably uh, the process worked out in the end. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think we, we, we have, I don't have statistics to, to quote you, but the accelerated approval pathway has been used for many, many products. Um, and the lucky thing is most of the time things do confirm out. Great, thank you. Um, and here's a question um, that I have a, a, a number of people have asked, and it's, is there a public list of FDA-approved cellular gene therapy drugs that's up to date? And actually, we have a resource. I just wanted to put this um, informational slide up, and, and then maybe you can just um, you know, say a word or two about what's on the FDA website. So our, our website, um, it, if you click on that link, we, there, are, there are currently uh, two cell-based gene therapy products and two directly administered gene therapy products approved in the United States. Um, that number is slightly different from other regulatory authorities globally, and that's a, a, another day's discussion, but um, we're, uh, we're all pretty close to one another in, 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 in the numbers we have approved in, in terms of uh, the major regulatory authorities. But, and one can go to this link and see uh, the background of the approvals. One can see what the package insert looks like. Um, uh, and uh, as we have additional approvals, they will also get posted on those, that website. Great, great. Um, Dr. Marks, you noted that the FDA evaluates the safety and a legal definition of efficacy. So I have a question asking, what does the latter mean? In other words, the legal definition of efficacy. So we, we have a, an efficacy standard, which is a statutory standard, um, which was put in place to try to ensure that when something reaches the market, there is a, a, a good chance that it is actually going to bring benefit to people. And that basically means that it has to have been studied um, in, uh, in trials, uh, without going into the exact statutory standard, bottom line is that for larger indications, it generally means that one has to do two well-controlled trials. Um, but in the rare diseases space, it means that one generally does, has to do at least one well-controlled trial and then have supportive evidence um, that says that the product um, uh, is, is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And the, the reason for having that legal definition um, is it does, does say that our approvals have to reach a certain bar, that it's not like a race to the bottom of just how little, um, you know, that, that things don't have to really have a, a, a good chance of having an effect. Things that we approve, we believe, will be um, efficacious when given to people. That's not to say that we're correct 100% of the time. Uh, sometimes we find out after the fact that products that we thought were effective were not uh, as effective or effective at all, or that they had safety flaws that lead us to take them off the market. Um, but we want to do our best to make sure that when people take products, um, they are going to be really benefiting from them. One of the wonderful things about the gene therapy space, though, is that to date, in general, what we see are products in this space that are so transformative that um, the clinical review, the, the, the clinical outcomes that we often see are so clear um, that they very easily meet our standards for efficacy. So there's not really a big discussion to be had there. Um, uh, so. In the gene therapy space, it's, it's kind of an exciting place to be because we're not really arguing over whether a product gets over uh, the standard for efficacy, 
Uh, it's actually oftentimes whether the product can be made in a sufficient quantity and in a reproducible enough quantity uh, to meet the demand. Okay, that's a very helpful clarification. Thank you. Um, we are quickly running out of time, but um, we have. Uh, let, me, let me fit in at least one more question, and I see that many questions are pouring in. So again, if we've gotten to the end of this webinar and haven't answered a question that you want answered, please do email us at education at rarediseases.org. So next question, I've seen stem cell clinics popping up, sometimes in strip malls or local venues. What should patients know about these entities? Are they regulated by the FDA? What has FDA done to take action against the ones that are not operating in compliance with the law? A great question. And so let me say that uh, stem cells that are given, by and large, these are regulated by the FDA. Um, and indeed, for many cases, we uh, are trying to take action against uh, clinics that are uh, selling, uh, that are literally selling unapproved therapies. Um, the problem is that the problem, as some people might have noticed, is widespread enough that we can't be everywhere all the time. Um, we've made it very clear that this is not something that we're going to tolerate um, over the long term, and that we will take action, particularly right now against those that are placing uh, the public health at risk. If you're contemplating a, a stem cell therapy, I would make sure that you have a conversation with your provider. That's the person to talk to about it, the person who takes care of you. Make sure that, that you understand what the therapy that you're going to be getting is. And in general, if you're getting a stem cell therapy for anything other than a blood cancer or a blood disease or uh, an inherited immunologic condition, you're probably going to be getting it uh, as part of a clinical trial uh, and you'll have to sign informed consent. So if you're not having to sign informed consent and be part of a clinical trial and it's stem cells for something, a uh, condition like a neurologic condition uh, or an inherited condition that's not of the blood or immune system, uh, you probably should be asking some questions because they, those should always be done under, uh, under informed consent and under FDA oversight at this point. We don't have approved products uh, in those spaces in the cell and gene therapy space yet, with the exception of the ones that are on our website. Now, it's an important point and important for people to understand. So this is an exciting time for gene therapy. We appreciate um, all the efforts on uh, that the FDA's, FDA is undertaking to make them available and safe and effective. Um, and clearly, from the number of questions that are still pouring in, there's a lot of interest in the topic. We thank everybody in the audience for joining us today. And once again, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Marks and Ms. Tierney, for your engaging presentations and your um, thorough and informative answers to our questions. Thank you very much. Everybody have so a good much. day.